bees construct elaborate nests with thousands of symmetrical and perfectly sized honeycombs? How do ants and termites construct vast layers above and underground that have ventilation and heating control and some amazing architectural features? The answer lies in a scientific concept called emergent behavior. Today we're going to be looking at that inside a simple scratch project and see how order can sometimes emerge from chaos. Stay tuned. So emergent behavior is a concept that comes from biologists who are trying to explain how simple creatures who are working independently along with thousands of other peers can create these complex structures and perform complex behaviors when no one's really coordinating what they're doing. It turns out if you look at the individual behavior of ants in a colony or bees in a hive, that each individual is operating under a very strict set of rules where they move in one direction for a little bit until something changes, until they get too close to one of their neighbors or something appears in front of them. Once you look at it from that perspective, it doesn't look too different from coding. So this idea that really simple, symmetrical, and sometimes beautiful structures can arise from the seemingly random movements of creatures in the wild was of particular interest to a researcher by the name of Christopher Langton. Now he was a computer scientist in California who back in the 1980s started researching artificial life forms. He was using code to create simple creatures inside of a computer that would interact with each other and with their environment following a simple set of rules. Along the way, he started to learn about how order can arise from the seeming chaos of simple creatures following simple instructions. Now for today's project, we're gonna need access to Scratch's pen tools. That's not a normal part of Scratch's block set, so we have to load it up using the extensions menu at the bottom left of the screen here. So click on this blue button and click on the second item over pens. You'll see that we have a whole new set of nine green blocks here that all control how to draw stuff on the screen. The one we're especially interested in today is a stamp tool. And what the stamp does is basically duplicates whatever sprite it is that's active on the screen here and makes a copy of it on the background layer. So it's not an actual sprite that you can move around. Let me try clicking on this and you can see that when we move the sprite out of the way, we have um, an image of the ant pasted down at the back of the screen here. Now you can't interact with this in any way. It's basically just a drawing on the screen. And every time this stamp is invoked, we get a new image on the screen. So these stamped images are temporary and they can be removed at any time by clicking on the erase all button on the screen just like that. Okay, we're gonna have a look at the code in a second, but first let's resize this ant who I blew up to unnatural proportions to show you the stamp tool. Let's get him back down to 100%. And you can see he's just a tiny little fella. So uh, let's have a look at the code here. We've got a variable called steps that's just keeping track of how many particular steps this ant has moved, which is basically how long this simulation has been running. We have an erase all here that'll get rid of everything from the last run of the experiment so that we don't have any shapes stamped on our screen here. We're gonna move our ant right to the beginning and I'm gonna tell him to face right. It doesn't really matter what direction he's facing with this, when this experiment starts though. And we're gonna tell him to wear his ant costume rather than one of those two blocks that I showed you before. Now we just want this experiment continuing until it reaches a natural end point. This guy's gonna be wandering around the map, but if he happens to touch an edge, we're not gonna get any good data anymore because he's gonna um, start to move sideways along the edge and not be able to do what he wants to do. So as soon as he touches the edge, we're just gonna stop the experiment and that'll take quite a while to happen as you can see here. So we're gonna keep running through this loop here where we switch our costume to, it, or to the ant costume. I'm gonna wait a little bit here just to so that you guys can understand what's happening. We'll remove these weights later and we'll want our experiment to run a lot faster. So we're moving on a 16 by 16 grid, which means that we're gonna have to move 16 steps every way. And every time we move, we're going to change the step variable to one, by one. And that's gonna keep track of how far we've walked here. And after taking our step, we're gonna hit pause again and then play a little sound 
before we change the color of the square beneath us. So you remember I mentioned that our ants are going to be following a simple set of instructions. Right now they're only just moving forward, just moving forward one step at a time, move and make a pop sound, move and make a pop sound. Next I'm going to get them to try and change the color of the square underneath them. So every time an ant enters a square, he's going to have a look at what the color is underneath them. I'm going to do this with an if else statement, so let's pop that in here. So I'm going to get it looking for the color black, and I'm going to tell it if I enter a square that's the color black, I'm going to turn left 90 degrees, and I'm going to switch my costume to white. Now we're going to stamp that costume down, so basically he's going to change the color of the square underneath him to white when he does that. If he doesn't step on black, which means he's already on a white square, he's going to take that square and change it to black. So basically what's happening is every time an ant um, enters a square, he's going to flip that square over to the opposite color. And depending on which color he's already on, he's either going to turn left or turn right. Now once he finishes doing that, we're going to stamp down that block, uh, either the black block or the white block, to change the color of the underlying screen. And then we're going to switch our costume back to the ant again so that our ant can come around to take the next step. So let's run this little experiment and see what happens here. So our steps are at zero and you can see that our little fellow is walking along and it seems like he's going to be doing basically the same thing but at some point things start to get a little more erratic. It looks like he's just basically trying to fill up the whole screen with colors here. But as he moves along, following these simple instructions, things get a little more chaotic. Now we're at step 25 here, and you can see that it's starting to make some interesting shapes. I want to speed up this experiment now and show you what's happening as this ant continues. We're going to go into thousands of steps here, um, because as time goes on, you're going to see that things start to evolve here. So I've gone back to my code and I've removed those delays, which we don't really need here. I just have them there to illustrate what our ant was doing at a speed that you guys could understand. But now that we get this whole routine, let's speed things up. We've gotten rid of the delay and we've also gotten rid of that annoying popping sound. Let's run our simulation again. As you can see, he's continuing to just move around in seemingly random directions, creating a seemingly random pattern on the screen. The one thing we can observe of it is that it's steadily getting bigger as time goes on, but he keeps wandering back to the middle again and adding to this pattern as he goes along here. So our simulation's going to keep running here and our ant's going to continue to uh, travel around in a wider and wider path, but we're going to run out of steam here in a minute when he bangs his head against the bottom left wall right at around 900 here. So it turns out that our screen isn't quite big enough to run this experiment, which means we're going to have to shrink our ant down. This was a good little illustration of how this project works, but uh, to make this really fly, we're going to have to go with a smaller ant. I'm going to disconnect the code here and go to a second sprite called Ant2. This is the same code basically that I used in the first project, except that my sprites have been shrunk down to one quarter of their current size. My ant, I haven't even bothered with an ant graphic anymore, I just have a little purple square here. And these two squares are four pixels by four pixels. And our movement here is going to be four steps. So when I run this pro program now, you'll see that we get the same kind of effect but we're running on a much smaller scale here, which will allow us to see this experiment through to its natural conclusion here. So to see this project really working in overdrive, we're gonna get into turbo mode, which is a special version of Scratch that runs without any frame rate restrictions. So if you have a fast computer, you'll see that you can run this incredibly quickly just by going to the edit menu here and selecting turn on turbo mode. So let's run the project again and see what happens. So as you can see, the pattern continues to grow here. And it's pretty much doing just more of the same thing. 
but somewhere around the 10,000 mark, you're going to see something quite remarkable start to happen. There it is there. So amid all the chaos of this ant kind of seemingly wandering around the screen aimlessly, at some point around step 2000, he starts doing something entirely predictable. He breaks out of his chaotic pattern and starts building a little road off the screen. So it turns out that no matter what obstacles you put in the ant's way, he'll still end up making the same roadway pattern at some point in the process. Uh, to show you that, I've created a simple little script here that puts random black and white tiles down along the center of the screen here before we start our project. So basically when I hit a button here, it just generates a random pattern of black and white squares. We're going to place our ant down in the middle here again and see what he does. And let's run the experiment one more time. And you can see that again, he's made a little road this time in a different direction. Let's try it one more time. And again in a different direction. Let's try it one last time. So it seems like this transition from something chaotic into something that's quite orderly is actually something that happens quite a bit in nature among living things and non-living things. A snowflake, for example, is a perfect example of uh, random molecules of water coming together and yet somehow forming a beautiful and elegant pattern based on rules that we can only just barely understand. Computers have been really helpful for helping us sort out this behavior in the animal kingdom and um, in the natural world as well. And it's a really fascinating area of study. So I'd encourage you to keep playing around with this simulation. There's all kinds of different variations you can do. Right here I have two ants going. And you can see they both independently find their pathway and eventually start making their own roads. And it'll work basically the same way with five or six or however many of these little ants you want running around the screen. You can also program different ants with different rules as well. So you can have uh, one kind of ant that will turn left when it hits a black and another one that will turn right when it hits a black. You can also have your ants draw patterns that aren't in right angles. You can have them turn at 45 degree angles, for example, and all kinds of fun variations on that. Have them paint different colors on the screen and you'll, um, no matter what happens, you'll see some remarkable results emerge from this. So uh, a nice little introduction to simulating life on the computer. Hope you enjoyed that.